Tonight we are doing part two of Patterns, and um, we spent part one not so much talking about the patterns when it comes to holiness, but as much as trying to establish that the idea of patterns and typology in Scripture was not just a good idea that some person came up with, it was God's intent, it was God's design. And so this evening, I want to talk to you about some of the patterns that are clearly established throughout Scripture when it comes to this topic of holiness. I, I, I want you to see a pattern. Now, this is not in the context of holiness. This is in the context of there, there is something that we face today that the children of Israel faced all the way back when, when, when they were a natural people, God's chosen people. I, I want to show you, and there's a great, there's a chapter that really kind of shows this very concisely, and, and that's Judges chapter 2. And I want, to, I want to read a couple of verses from a couple of different parts of this chapter. First off is Judges 2 and 11. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger, and they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Verse 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. Their fathers obeyed the commandments, but they didn't do so. Then God would raise up more judges. And then verse 19, It came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers. Notice that. This third time, they didn't just corrupt themselves. They're now outdoing their fathers in a bad way. Corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them, they ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. I'm not going to drive out any of their enemies anymore. When they entered the promised land, he was driving out their enemies. He was giving them victory. Yeah, they had to fight some battles, but he was giving them the victory. And now he says, you're going through this cycle, this pattern of, of, of responding and then, and then erring, wandering. And now I'm going to stop helping you. I will also not drive out from before them the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. So what he's saying now is, if this is the way you want it, I'm going to play your game. I'm going to leave the enemy there to test you and prove you. And, and this pattern, this cycle of the natural children of Israel can be seen, unfortunately, in the church. The, devil's, the, the, the enemy's tactic with the children of Israel was to get them to, to just take on the practices, the behaviors, the, life, the lifestyle of the nations around them. And here we are in 2021 as the spiritual children of Israel and the exact same thing we are facing. 
The enemy wants the church to take on the practices of the world around us, to take on the practices of other forms of Christianity. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered He them into the hand of Joshua. I've, I've, I've talked about this at times in the last little while in various ways. I don't think I've talked about it in quite this context as I will right now, but uh, uh, last night, we, we again, just, just so you don't judge me, we, we, we didn't announce a complete social media fast because we're using social media and 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 I know some of you are strong enough to go on there look at Antioch Central see what's on there and get off but I'm not quite that strong okay and 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 I got somehow I, I've gotten there's a couple of things Facebook has a has a, a button at the bottom that that basically is for all videos. You can you can just it's video after a variety of videos, and somehow there's 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 a couple of different themes that are somehow popped up and 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 I don't know how, I'd never heard of this person never heard but last night there was this church service from the West Coast being live streamed. And I'm sitting there watching it, and they're singing. They've got their hands raised, eyes closed, and they're responding. And they show crowd shots, and the crowd all has their hands raised, and they're all singing. And they're singing, holy is the Lord, and all this stuff. And, 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 and from observation, there appears to be a move of God going on. But, but they're, they're, there's, there's smoke on the stage. The lights are all dim, and, and, and the people on the stage, Stage. Look, you, you don't know if they're in a rock group or what they are. But again, it looks. And, and, and again, there, there are things I say that I'm afraid they may disillusion some, but I'll risk that to help others. I sit there and I watch that and the enemy starts on my mind. Do you, you really think the way you guys are doing it? I mean, look at this. Look what's happening. Don't you think you might? And in fact, this group was, it was a predominantly young group. It looked like several hundred, at least young adult, basically. It was a young adult service. Thinking, man, wonder if we could draw more people if we turn down the lights, got a little bit of smoke. And we, we actually might. But again, a statement I've restated many times that Brother Kenneth Haney said, a crowd is not a church. But here's the point I want you to get, and I've watched this. I'm watching this. I'm seeing this happen. The church, what is supposed to be the church, is adapting things from the world around them. We're turning off the lights, and we're turning up colored lights and we're getting smoke literally the same smoke they're using for a cup we've now got it in a church service yes. Come on. Right. because we're taking on right. yep. the practices from those around us that we are supposed to be separated from and and so my, my primary point is to challenge you tonight we're not really dealing with anything new what we are dealing with tonight in a spiritual sense, you can see the children of Israel dealt with it decade after decade, generation after generation. That's why they would end up in bondage. God's like, okay, that's the way you want it? Have at it. Now let's see if it's really what you wanted. And then they get in bondage and now what are they doing? Oh God, this isn't what we wanted. Deliver us. Get us out of here. We are just simply dealing in a spiritual context with what the children of Israel dealt with in a natural one. The scary thing is we got people seemingly left and right that are given in to the deception and the trickery. There is no place in Scripture where God ever communicated to His body, His people, collectively or individually, that you need to become like those around you to reach them. I agree 100% 
with Brother Mike McGurk's statement about the guy with tattoos. But that doesn't mean you and I all run out and get tattoos. And the enemy's trying to get us to take on the practices of the world, thinking we will better reach them, knowing that what we're doing is becoming more and more like them and less and less like Jesus. And that's exactly what he wants. So this, this idea of separation starts in Genesis 1. Genesis 1 and 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Verse 4, four verses in. Four verses in. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided, separated the light from the darkness. Four verses in, God begins to establish the idea of separation. Light and darkness are to be separated. They are to be divided. What fellowship has light with darkness? telling you folks, the only people that are buying into the deception of the enemy are those that are really not paying attention to the Word of God. They're listening to human arguments. But ultimately, they're hum listening to human arguments that have been motivated by spiritual darkness. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And he saw the light. It was good. But the darkness and the light were not to be connected. They were to be divided. These first couple of verses are a picture of salvation. The New Testament, I, I shared it recently preaching. If you read the Message Bible, John chapter 3. The terminology in the Message Bible, those first couple of verses about being born again, it uses identical terminology as, as this here. You and I, when we are saved, our lives were without form and void, and there was darkness in our lives. But the Spirit of God begins to move in our lives. And out of the darkness and the chaos and the confusion of our lives, here we are. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, Jesus understood. All I had to offer Him was brokenness and strife. But He made something beautiful of my life. And it's an ongoing process of... God's Spirit pulling stuff out of us. And I don't mean pulling stuff out of us in the bad sense. I mean pulling stuff out of us in the good sense. In addition to this idea of separation, there's another principle that we find at the very beginning of the Bible, and that's in Genesis chapter 6, when God is instructing Noah to build the ark. He did not say, Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth with a flood. I want you to build a boat. Have at it. He said, I want you to build an ark. But here are the specifics with which I want it to be built. I want it to be this kind of wood. I want it to have this many floors. I want it to have one door. I want it to have one window. Period. Point blank period, as Bishop would say. I am, I am absolutely confident, I believe with all of my heart, if Noah would have altered one thing in the design of that ark, it would not have floated and made it through the storm. If he'd have just added a couple of windows, I mean, just a couple of windows. What's a couple of windows? Well, when God said one windows, a couple of windows is not in alignment with what 
God said. So in Genesis 1, we find from the very beginning an idea that God is into separation. Genesis 6, we find that God's got some specific ideas about the, 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 in this context, the ark represents the church, salvation. And then again in Genesis chapter 12, we find as God calls Abraham and enters into covenant with Abraham. Genesis 12, verse number 1, The Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. I need you to separate from. I need there to be separation from what you've been used to, Abraham. I need there to be separation from the life you've lived. F.B. Meyer says this, In the separation of Abraham from country, kindred, and father's house, the story of his people was foreshadowed. As Balaam, under the inspiration of the Almighty, said, Lo, it is a people that dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Their dress, rites, customs, religious habits were carefully and expressly determined to accentuate their separation. Read that again. Their dress, rites, customs, religious habits were carefully and expressly determined to accentuate their separation. That That being withdrawn from the influence of surrounding nations, they might be fitted to receive, keep, and transmit the knowledge of God. In no other way could they have borne the precious deposit entrusted to them down through the centuries and maintained their unbroken witness to the unity, spirituality, and holiness of God. Not otherwise could they have become the religious poets, prophets, and teachers of mankind. If Abraham would have stayed amongst his kindred, amongst his people, he would have never entered into covenant with God. And we have a message of salvation being preached today. You can get saved and maintain all of your connections, all of the lifestyle. You don't have to change. God will love you just where you are. It's all good. Show up to church on a Sunday morning, have an hour or so of worship and praise and hear a nice little motivational message and do the rest of the time what you want to do and it's all good. That comes from the pits of hell. And it comes from the pits of hell because the pits of hell know if you'll buy into that message, you're going to hell. No other way to fully embrace and receive what God has than to be willing to come out from. Now watch this. God brings the children of Israel out of Egypt. Again, every, everything. I, I love it. I, 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 I love discovering new uh, uh, perspectives on this of, of all of the different things that God did through the children of Israel, with the children of Israel, for the purpose of teaching you and I spiritual lessons today. It's an amazing thing to see how intentional God was doing things to establish. I, I, was, I was reading it again as I was preparing for this evening. The whole thing of, of, of Abraham and the way that Abraham entered into a covenant with God was typology of what was to happen for you and I. And so what took place on the day of Pentecost, the, the, the things that happened there connects all the way back to Abraham entering into covenant with God. And people want to just stop in the New Testament. Are you kidding me? All we need is the New Testament. Why would you not want to see that what the New Testament says, the significance of it can go all the way back to Genesis? That's why we say, well, as apostolics, Pentecostals, we trace our roots back to the day of Pentecost. No, we don't. 
as apostolics, we can trace our roots all the way back to the beginning of time. This doesn't go back to Azusa Street. It doesn't go back to the day of Pentecost. It goes all the way back to the beginning. That's why what we believe and teach and preach is not up for compromise. It didn't come from some church organization. It didn't come from some religious institution. It came from the foundational principles of the Word of God all the way back to the beginning. Hallelujah. So God brings the children of Israel out of Egypt and what He's doing with them is just a foreshadowing of what He ultimately wants to do. And shortly after bringing them out, He gives Moses the instructions. We can find them in Exodus 25 and verse 1. He's, again, when the children of Israel come out of Egypt, God brings them out with the intention of taking them to the promised land. That was, it. That was God's desire. The 40 years of wandering in the wilderness wasn't God's plan. Obviously, God knew in advance that's what was going to happen, but that wasn't God's plan. And so immediately after coming out of Egypt, God begins to establish things in the, in the people of Israel, in the, in the lives of Israel, as to what they needed so that they could function in the promised land. The Scripture tells us clearly the giving of the law to the children of Israel wasn't for them to function as sinners. It was to know how to live in the land of promise. So this idea that you get saved and there's no law, there's no, there's no governing of God's Spirit and God's Word, somebody needs to go back to the pattern. Exodus 25 and verse number 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take of them, gold, silver, brass, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin dyed red, and badger skins and Shatim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and then the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And again, permit me for a moment to use my imagination. Here is a God is speaking to a man who spent the most formative years of his life, the first 40 years of his life. He spent it in the most dominant culture of the world at that time, Egypt. He spent it in a nation that was advanced for their time. The ones that are known for the great pyramids, great architecture. Perhaps Moses was living there at the time some of those things were being built, taught by some of the most knowledgeable people in all of Egypt. I, I just, I just, again, my imagination is when God said, I want you to make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among. I can just picture Moses going, oh man, I got this. Oh boy, you want us to build you a sanctuary? We can do that. And all of a sudden, all these images from Egypt and the things he had seen built, maybe things he had helped build, start coming to mind, thinking, boy, we can can build God something. And yet God doesn't even pause, and he goes on to say, according to all that I show you, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall... Oh, wait a minute, God! You give me a little bit of creative license on this. And from these verses all the way to chapter 28, into chapter 28, it is all of God's dis- instructions to Moses about the size, the instruments, the materials. I'm just going to hit a couple high points just to give you a little bit of flavor. But I would encourage you to take some time in the next couple of days to read chapters 25 through 28 of Exodus and see the specificity with which God instructed Moses to build the tabernacle. 
Again, let me just give you a couple of examples. Verse 31 of chapter 25. Thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, his flowers shall be of the same. Six branches, not seven, not five, not eight. Six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of the one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds with a knop and a flower in one branch and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that came out of the candlestick and in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knops and their flowers. And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same and a knop under two branches of the same and a knop under two branches of the same according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knops I don't even know what a knop is but it sure sounds cool. Their knops and their branches shall be of the same all it shall be beaten, one beaten work of pure gold. 26.3 The five curtains, not the four, not the one, not the ten, not the eight. The five curtains shall be coupled together one to another, and other five curtains shall be coupled one to another, and thou shalt make loops of blue upon the edge of the one curtain from the selvage in the coupling. Not orange, not green, not gold, not purple. I want the loops to be blue. Likewise shalt thou make in the uttermost edge of another curtain in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops, not forty-five, not thirty, not seventy-five, not eighty. Fifty loops shalt thou make in the one curtain, and fifty loops shalt thou make in the edge of the curtain that is in the coupling of the second, that the loops may take hold one of another. And thou shalt make fifty tachets of gold, and couple the curtains together with the tachets. And it shall be one tabernacle, and thou shalt make curtains of goat's hair. But God, Campbell's hair is a lot nicer. Sheepskin would be more attractive. Goat's hair to be a covering upon the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shalt thou make. 2635, thou shalt, here we go, now he's told them the what, now he tells them where. Thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over and against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and thou shalt put the table on the north side. It wasn't just how to build it, what to build it with, what the instruments were, it was where they were supposed to go. Exodus 27, 17, all the pillars round about the court shall be filled with shall be filleted with silver, their hooks shall be of silver and their sockets of brass. The length of the court shall be a hundred cubits and the breadth fifty everywhere, and the height five cubits of fine twine linen and their sockets of brass. And again, three chapters. The last chapter gets into the, the garments of those that were ministering in the tabernacle, what they were supposed to wear, the very, very specifics about what they were supposed to Three chapters of all of these details about how the tabernacle was to be built. What's the big deal with that, Brother Wright? Well, let's see what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God. Amplified Bible says it this way. Do you not know? I like this because it goes back to the terminology that we read about in Exodus. Do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, whom you have received as a gift from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Purchased with a preciousness and paid for, made his own, so then honor God and bring glory to him in your body. Weiss translation says, or do you not know that your body is an inner sanctuary of the Holy Spirit? Three chapters. Materials. Dimensions. Furniture, what the furniture was supposed to be made of. Numbers of 
of, 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 of uh, rings and numbers of this and all that. Three chapters of instruction about the place God was going to dwell. I said this the first week, I think, of this class. I need you to show me one thing. If holiness doesn't matter in 2021, if separation is not important in 2021, then I need you to show me one thing, and that is when God changed. If you can show me God changed at some point, I will accept that we can have some kind of a relationship with God and have salvation and live however we want to live, act however we want to act, dress however we want to dress, go wherever we want to go, do whatever we want to do, and it's all good with God. Just show me when He changed. The problem is you can't do that without violating the Word of God. Because Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ, which we know to be God manifested in the, pl- in the flesh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if God cared about the tabernacle with Moses as much as He did to give the specifics that He gave, He cares about this temple. He cares in detail about this temple. And I agree 100%. This is not about doing all the dotting the I's and crossing the T's of external things and having bad attitudes and bad spirits and treating people wrong and all. I, I, that, that is not. But here's the problem. Too many people are throwing out the things that do apply to the outside because there's people that have done the outside and didn't have it on the inside. Jesus didn't tell the Pharisees to stop paying tithes on mint, anise, and cumin and all. He didn't tell them to stop. He just said, you're doing all that, but on the inside you're dead. See, I've touched on this already in the last couple of weeks, but Ezekiel 36 and 24, again, this is what it's all about. I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. And here's what my spirit in you is going to do. It's going to cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. Oh, God loves us. He don't care how we live. He don't care what we do. He just, he, he loves us. He, that's, that's not what the, that's not what the prophecy here says. Prophecy here says, he's going to put something in me that's going to cause me not to want to continue the way I was. Not to want to continue living The way I was. Not to want to continue blending in to my old life, my own way, my old ways. Something in me that's going to cause me to want to walk in his statutes and his just. Paul said it this way. Because of God's grace. Should we just continue in sin then? Hey, God's grace is wonderful. God's grace is awesome. So let's just live however we want to live because God's grace is going to take... No! Paul says, God forbid! Because if I've participated in true salvation, I'm not going to want to continue in those things. True salvation is going to change my desires. It's, It's going to change what I am pursuing. 
It's not going to be looking for a way. How can I, how can I marry these two worlds? How can I marry my old life, the things... I, I, I've heard some people at times talk about their saved folks, at least what I think are saved folks, talk about their past and what they used to be and do, but it, it almost comes across sometimes with some folks that it's, they're not talking about it out of thankfulness. They're talking about it that they kind of miss some things. I, I, I am, I'm, 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 I'm concerned at times that uh, not, not as much so when we first believed and we were first repented and were born again. But I'm concerned that a lot of times in our relationship with God, as we are already walking with God, that we deceive ourselves a lot of times thinking we repented when we didn't repent. Because true repentance is not just an apology for what I did. Some people, I think, view repentance in 2020 slang, 2021 slang. Oh, my bad. My bad, God, but we're good. And I shouldn't have done that, but you know, it's all right. You and me, we got, it, we got a good thing going. True repentance. You have not, let me say it this way, you have not truly repented until there is a change of mind, a change of heart. True repentance is not, well, I shouldn't have done that. God, forgive me. But, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of glad I did it. That's not true repentance. That's not true repentance. True repentance is not just an apology. I think there's, there, in, a, in essence, there's an apology, if you will, a part of repentance. Yeah, you need to express your sorry. But there needs to be a change of mind, a change of heart. I want to I pull away from that. But he, he, I, I just... Verse 24 again, Ezekiel 36. I'm going to take you from the heathen, but I'm going to bring you in too. The wilderness was not the destination. It wasn't God's destination for His people. That was only a part of the transition from Egypt to the promised land. I said at the very first week, holiness is about separation from, but it's also just as much, just as important, it's separation to. The people that resent this separation are those that are more focused on what they're separated from. How? Pray tell me. I think that may be a southern term. Pray tell me. How do, you, how do you come out of 400 plus years of bondage, slavery, the last, the last several days, weeks, months, whatever of that, being the worst of all of it? Taskmasters that are un, unbearable to work under? And within days... Within days of being free from that, you're saying you'd rather go back to that. Would God, we, did, what'd you do, Moses, bring us out here to die? Would God, we would have died in Egypt. At least we had leeks and garlics and something to eat. Beside, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Freedom from bondage and slavery just because you can't you're you're you you know you're you're getting the same old miraculous provision every day. <laughs> What's for dinner today? Manna. Great. Yeah, but, yeah, but w w hold on a second. Let's talk about where that manna came from. You're in the middle of the wilderness. You've got no source. You've got no provision. And showing up miraculously day after day after day is provision. But you want to go back to bondage? 
I brought you out of, but I want to take you into. You know what? I, there are not things that I do now to be married. Most of what I do is because I'm married. Well, I got to do this because I'm married. I got to. No. I do it because that's who I am. That's what I do. Well, I got to go home tonight. Wife's waiting on me. Can't hang out with the fellows tonight. Got to go. Got the, uh, the wife's at home. No. Not if you're in a good relationship. Not if you're in a healthy marriage. That's not a drudgery. That's what you are looking forward to. Peter says this, 1 Peter 2 and 9, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his light, into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We, we only got, a, relatively speaking, a handful of people in this sanctuary tonight. A bunch more downstairs in the classes. But in just this handful of people. We come from all over the place, naturally speaking, location-wise. But then lifestyles, lives that we've come from. And yet here we are as a people tonight, connected with each other. There is a bond that we have. I, I, feel, I, feel, I feel as much at home right here, right now as I do at my house. I feel as comfortable and relaxed right here, right now with all of you as I do at home with just my family because we are now the people of God. We who were not a people come from different parts of the country and even the world and different backgrounds, different educational statuses and economics and all that stuff, but we are now a people. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Peculiar, peculiar, peculiar. That means different, set apart. When a girl gets engaged, slang is she gets a rock. Boy, did you see her rock? There is a parking lot out there full of rocks. Full of rocks. You probably could have saved a few dollars, Brother Gus. Skip the jewelry store. All you got to do is go out there and get a rock. Glue it on a ring and give her a rock. If he'd have done that, Lauren might be in jail tonight. <laughs> Why? Why? Because out there in that parking lot are thousands of rocks. No value because they're common. That rock that you put on a finger is unique, special, it's different. It gets its value from its uniqueness. Why do we want to just blend and fit in with a world and be like a parking lot of rocks? When God's called us to be peculiar, to be precious, to be His treasure, that is not a burden to bear. That is a privilege that we get the opportunity to embrace. Watch this, Esther two, chapter 2, Esther 2, verse 12. Uh, you know, I, I, I was in a conversation... Someone this morning, you know, there, there's this mindset, well, I don't, I don't really need the church. I don't need the body. And I definitely don't need a preacher. I don't need a pastor. 
Watch, watch this. Watch this. Esther 2 and 12. Now, when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been 12 months according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh, six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Do you, do you get what that's saying there? I think we think of the story of, of, uh, of Esther and uh, Xerxes was the king, right? I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but Vashti, Vashti, whatever, refuses to come before the king. Everybody gets up in arms. You've got to do something. All of our wives are going to rebel. <laughs> and so he decides to pick a new queen. I think we think, well, you know, a couple days later he picked a queen. Twelve months. They spent... 12 months of preparation to simply come before the king. An entire year of their life was taken away from them with no guarantee they would even become the queen. Then thus came, verse 13, then thus came every maiden unto the king, whatsoever, watch this now, whatsoever she desired was given to her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening she went and, she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women to, to the custody of Shazgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines, she came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by, by name. Living Bible says this, verse 12, The instructions concerning these girls were that before being taken to the king's bed, each would be given six months of beauty treatments with oil of myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. Then as each girl's turn came for spending the night with the king, Ahasuerus, not Xerxes, sorry. Ahasuerus, she was given her choice of clothing or jewelry. She wished to enhance her beauty. I don't know how many women went in before Esther, but I'm sure it was quite a number. And one after the other, they were provided whatever they wanted to wear, whatever garments, whatever jewelry, whatever color of garments they picked for themselves. And one after the other, they went before the king and left. But verse 15, watch this. When the turn of Esther the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king. She required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken into King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Woman after woman, after woman lady after lady, went before the king based on how they wanted to go before the king. Wear what they wanted to wear, dress how they wanted to dress. And one after the other didn't get the king's attention. But Esther decides, if I'm going to go before the king, maybe I ought to find out from somebody who knows the king what the king likes. And she submitted herself to Haggai for him to instruct her. The name Haggai means meditation, word, separation. She listened to a voice that instructed her to be different than the rest. And being willing to be different than the rest, she got the attention of the king. Last passage. I want you to watch this. Exodus 19, 11. Again, we're back now to children of Israel in the process. Still, still on pace, still on track with God's initial plan. Watch what the Lord says. Exodus 19, 11. And be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Now watch this. 
And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. Verse 12 again, the Lord, the Lord says to Moses, I want you to set bounds unto the people round about. I want you to draw a line of distinction around the mountain. The question, where does a mountain begin? We, uh, last week, my wife and I, we were supposed to go away in January for her birthday, and uh, several things interfered with that, and initially several things caused us to change her plans, and then she ended up in Pennsylvania with her parents because of them going through COVID. So that was, it's kind of amazing. God has a way of changing your plans you think for one reason, then you find out there was something else. So we rescheduled, and, and uh, last week we went away a couple days to Deep Creek Lake, and um, just she and I, and just to rest and relax a little bit. And, you know, again, I love Maryland, wouldn't want to live anyplace else in the world, but if you've ever been to the Rockies, it's it's kind of hard to call Western Maryland mountains mountains. They're they're just they're hills. <laughs> they're, I mean, I think twenty. I think I, I think one of the elevation signs I remember seeing was like twenty seven hundred feet. And I think that was the highest I remember. Twenty. I mean, you got mountains in Colorado that are five times that size. But even. Western Maryland, I would venture to say some of you have never seen the Rockies, but perhaps you've been to Western Maryland. You get out to Western Maryland, just get out on the other side of Frederick, you start some mountains. Where does it start? What is the line that distinguishes this is now the mountain? It's not one. It's, a, it's, a, it's essentially a gradual transition. And so God says to Moses, I'm about to do something, but before I do it, I want you to know anything that touches this mountain is going to die. Well, we, we need to know. We need to know where that line is, because I, I don't know about you, but if you're going to die if you touch the mountain, I'd like to know where the mountain is. And Moses drew the line. Now, I got to tell you, you get five guys, five men talking about any topic, and the chances of getting anybody to agree, all five to agree, is pretty slim. At least one guy, if for no other reason than to just be stubborn, is going to argue a different side. You get five guys talking about this black podium and one of them is going to say it's purple something. I guarantee you there was a lot of opinions that day about where the line for the mountain was. But someone had to draw the line. It's a dangerous thing to want to live for God without any covering of authority in your life. Because sometimes we need somebody else to help us to understand where the line is. Sometimes we need somebody else to help us because we don't really know exactly what the king likes. We're not fully aware what will get the eye of the king, but God puts people in our lives that if we will submit to them, if we will yield to the operation of the Spirit of God through them, they're going to help us come before the king and get the king's attention. They're going to help us know where that line is so that I can stay safe. God is about borders and lines and boundaries. I probably shouldn't say this because 
even in this small of a group, probably could get somebody mad, but even heaven has immigration laws. Even heaven has walls and gates. Everybody's welcome. But there's a certain way you're supposed to get in. Just let that stay right there for a moment. I am, Jesus said, the way that I know where I was going. Now I'm getting ahead of myself. I believe one of the things the enemy has tried so hard to do for years and years and years, probably really ultimately since the beginning of time, but I think we've seen it intensified in the last several decades, is to blur all of the lines to remove all of the lines. We're now seeing that in places we never would have imagined to see that. We're now seeing that with gender. We're now seeing that with who goes to the bathroom where. I'll never forget, it was early 2000s. My grandmother had been living in Mississippi for a while, had been back down there for a while. She was moving back up here. Timothy was about four years old. He and I flew down and... uh, we were going to drive the rental car or drive the U-Haul truck back up for her. And um, so it was, it was, again, this was, I think, 2004, 2005. And the U-Haul truck had a radio, no cassette, not even a cassette, just a radio and the dial, the line that you turned up and down. And I remember coming through North Carolina. I think it was the Charlotte area, if I'm not mistaken. And I had been turning trying to find something to listen to, gospel station, every new area I tried. And I came across this one station. I think when I first came to the station, there was a Christian song that was playing, and so I stopped there and left the dial right there. And in a moment or two, their tagline for their station came on, and I'll never forget it. It stuck with me since that day. The tagline, because they also played country music on the same station. And their radio's... That station's tagline was contemporary Christian music and good, clean country music. And they flip-flop continually back and forth between same station, between Christian music and good, clean country music. And I thought, is that not so classic of what the enemy is trying to do Blur everything together. Don't let there be a difference between those that go to church and those that don't. Let the people that go to church and profess to be Christians, profess to be disciples, let them dress, act, look, do the same things as everybody else. Because the enemy knows the power of separation. And the enemy knows that coming out from and being separated to is God's pattern. Father, I thank you again for tonight, what you have done in both sessions, what you have said in both sessions. I trust and believe that we have heard from you this evening, God, all throughout this evening. So as we close tonight, I pray that you would take the words that have been spoken in both of these sessions. Let them be sealed into our hearts and our spirits that they might produce what you would desire. Lord, the enemy would love to come along and steal these seeds that have been sown tonight before they have the opportunity to germinate and begin to grow and produce in our lives. And so I pray that it would be protected, that it might be able to produce the outcome, the harvest that you intend. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you throughout the weekend in Jesus' name.